Welcome everyone to the New Jersey Institute of Technology's Data Science Seminar Series. This is our first seminar of the spring 2021 semester. I'm David Bader, I'm a distinguished professor at NGIT, and I also direct the Institute for Data Science. I'm very pleased today to introduce our first speaker of the semester, Dr. Stephen Skiena. Dr. Skiena is a distinguished teaching professor of computer science and director of the Institute for AI-Driven Discovery and Innovation at Stony Brook University. His research interests include data science, bioinformatics, and algorithms. He's the author of six books, including the Algorithm Design Manual, the Data Science Design Manual, and Who's Bigger, Where Historical Figures Really Rank. Dr. Skiena's research has received extensive press coverage, including appearing in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and National Public Radio. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, a former Fulbright Scholar, and a recipient of the IEEE Computer Science and Engineer Teaching Award. So I am really pleased to have him speak today. And his topic is going to be on word and graph embeddings for machine learning. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, can everybody see uh, my slide now? Yes. I'm hoping that that's true. Okay, so this is a talk about some, you know, material that we've been working on for a long time. So some of these results were kind of old, some of them we're still going and working on now. Um, but it's about some tools for data science, word embeddings and graph embeddings that I think are, are very powerful tools now and recognized as very powerful tools. And um, so let, let me start off by giving you some kind of an idea of what word embeddings are about. Um, and it, 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 the principle gets down to how would you represent what a, a cat means in, to a computer? A lot of times you would like to represent words, the meaning of words and concepts in, in, in uh, you know, to make them useful for programs. You might imagine you could use a uh, definition, a cat, like, like a dictionary definition. You might say that picture is a cat. You might imagine that there's logical descriptions of what a cat is. A cat is something that has four legs and purrs and uh, is cute and stuff like that. Um, the thing at the bottom though, is what I wanna say a cat is, okay? What the, the thing at the bottom, what you see is a vector of length about 64 of numbers that are uh, either positive or negative. That's why they're um, red or blue. And I want you to come away from this talk convinced, yes, that's what a cat is. And it looks just like a dog. And if you get, get that far from my talk, then, um, then everything's gonna be fine. Um, let me also start off just by saying, um, if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions in the middle of this, if you wish. And uh, I probably have more stuff than I can talk about for an hour. And so I'm delighted if I don't cover everything, but uh, we'll just keep going. So word embeddings are these kind of distributed representations, these, uh, these, these notions that, uh, you know, you're representing, um, uh, hold on a second, sorry. That, that, that you'd like to um, represent each word by a vector, uh, a d-dimensional vector of numbers with the property that similar words have similar representations. That's kind of what you would like to do with it. And um, the way that you train these things is um, with something that you would call a fluency test. Um, suppose it's very easy over the web or anywhere else to find training data which is good English, okay? Um, if you wanna find what English is like, take anything you see on a web page, anything you see in Wikipedia. If you were randomly took the, a word in the middle of the sentence, a sentence that you found on the web, and you replace it by another word, okay? You're gonna have a different phrase. Almost certainly when you break it, when you change the word at random, you're gonna make the phrase incorrect or less good than the original. And so the way that we're gonna to try to train representations of what words mean is we are gonna give a, a um, machine learning classifier good phrases and broken phrases and ask them to try to tell them apart. 
it's clear we can so we can get large amounts of real good text. Okay, it's clear we can randomly insert words in the middle as much as we want. This gives us training data to train classifiers to separate good word phrases from bad phrases. And if you can do that, you must have along the way built an understanding, a model of what each word means in order to do that. Again, to show why that is, here you see the same task in Chinese. I do not speak Chinese, okay? But I am assured that if you take a look at the bottom sentences here, if you substitute the character in the middle of the top phrase for the character in the middle for the second phrase, it has no meaning. But if you can tell what these two things uh, are part, which is the right one, which is the broken one, you must know what the words actually mean. And that's kind of the idea behind uh, a famous program for generating um, word embeddings called word to vec okay? Basically, it's a network that, try, that given examples of good phrases and bad phrases, tries to train, which is, um, you know, basically trains, uh, backpropagates uh, representations for what the words are, these vectors, okay, that get better and better at making these kind of tests and along the way learn what the words mean. So here is an example of wor word embeddings of some popular words, types of words. The ones on the three are all animals. And if you look at this, even with your eye, you can tell that a dog is similar to a cat. Why is that? Because any phrase that uses the word cat most likely still works when you replace it with a dog. These are what all colors look like. And you can see the colors look very similar by usage. Um, you know, again, but quite different than animals. Numbers look similar to each other. Countries look similar to each other. These word embeddings capture what it is that the words actually kind of mean or do. And if you train word embeddings for all the language, for, for a large number of, uh, you know, on, on a large volume of text, you can come up with the relative meaning of each word in the vocabulary. And the words naturally cluster by what their roles are. Um, Again, can you guys see my, um, what you call it, my, uh, my pointer when I do this? Yes. Okay, so over here you see where the states kind of naturally clustered. And I think these were cities, no, no, those were cities. And I think these may be countries. And you'll see nouns and verbs and things like this. Basically, these representations capture a lot of what the, the words mean in an unsupervised way. Okay, any questions about what I mean by a word embedding? I'm gonna, rest of my talk is gonna drive um, basically some things that you can do with these word embeddings, including going off into uh, a, a surprising direction to try to figure out, help understand properties of graphs. But let's for now start in words. Um, again, you know, just like I could train word embeddings in English, there's no reason why I couldn't train if you gave me a, a, a bunch of text written in French or a, a large text corpus of Azerbaijani, okay, I should be able to train word embeddings for each of these other languages. And so one of the things my group did a while ago, but quite early in this machine learning, re relatively early in this machine learning NLP revolution, which has taken place, um, I wanted my, we wanted to build Thing, systems that did basic NLP, okay? But we wanted it to work on all languages, 100 languages, rather than optimizing something for one language. And this is the kind of thing machine learning is very, very good for. First, these word embedding technologies work equally well in any, in, you know, essentially every language. This represents um, words that are similar in, um, you know, the, I guess the argument here is that the first word in each one of these little tables is kind of the center. We're then showing you what are the five closest neighbors to it. You can think of these word embeddings as being points in high dimensions. What are the nearest neighbors to rouge in French? Well, you get other colors in French. What are the nearest things to dentist in Spanish? Well, you get other professions like ophthalmologist and barber and gynecologist. 
What is the nearest thing to, to Mumbai, the city in English? You get other Indian cities, okay? What is the nearest thing to Putin? Okay, in Russian, you get other Russian leaders, okay? And again, this is what you would kind of make sense. If these word embeddings capture what the meaning of the word is, nearby words should play similar roles, okay? And if the, the, the shape of these embeddings is basically the same in every language, you should be able to use them to train a class of, you know, train models for doing the basic NLP. This is the most amazing figure that you'll see that I present today. This is, um, I, I, I wanted my students to um, build uh, basic NLP systems in a hundred languages. And the team to do it was basically Rami, that one person alone by machine learning could build NLP systems for a hundred languages. Okay, is something that only could make sense in a world of machine learning. Um, we used Wikipedia to train the uh, word embeddings. We used the Wikipedia to, um, what do you call it? To uh, um, annotate other forms of data. The hyperlinks would typically link to pages that were for people, places, or things. So we could train named entity recognition systems in all these languages, okay? Using the links, uh, the hyperlinks in Wikipedia as uh, in some sense an annotation of, you know, if it, if it went to a person page or a, uh, a, a, a place page, we could kind of do these things, okay? And it shows the power of these kind of word embeddings. Uh, and, you know, basically in the days since then, word embeddings and their successors, more sophisticated language models are basically how you do natural language processing these days which has had tremendous uh, advances. Any questions about that? Okay, if not, uh, I'm gonna keep rolling until I hear complaints. Um, so, but, but you can use word embeddings for lots of other things. Word embeddings capture what words mean. And there are a lot of other things you, you can do that are interesting with word embeddings if you, uh, you, know, if, 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 you know, if you think about it a little bit. Um, again, I'm kind of interested in history. A lot of the work we've done, including the book David mentioned, had to do with analyzing Wikipedia to try to get some senses of the magnitudes and roles of historical figures. One thing I'm interested in is um, the history of language and the question of how is it that meanings of words evolve, okay? So words, the meaning of words change over time, okay? Sometimes words pick up new senses, okay? Sometimes old senses disappear, okay? Sometimes, you know, uh, they're, in, you know, entirely new words created. The claim would be that we, that, that I'd like to show is that um, use of word embeddings gives you ways of understanding whether the me words have changed meaning over time. Here's an example of a plot that we were able to produce. A word that, that, that changed its meaning a lot is the word gay. When I grew up, gay meant happy, okay? And it, it meant happy, it meant cheerful, it meant this. But over the years, it, it morphed towards being the, you know, uh, the word homosexual. And the question would be, how could you determine when words like this change meaning? Word embeddings over a corpus tell you what a word means in the words that you're in the text that you've analyzed. Can we use this property to try to plot how words change over time? And so the so to do this, we 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 decided we were going to train word embeddings on text produced from books over every five year period, starting from 1900. Okay, Google has scanned a large number of books. There's a wonderful website called Google Engrams that reports on um, basically the frequency of all short phrases that appeared in books as a function of time. But as a result of that, we know how often short phrases, we know all the short phrases that occurred in books in 1900, in 1905, in 1910, in 1915, 
we could use this data to train different, different uh, word embeddings over each window, okay, over each year, and then convert these word representations into a, a, a unified space by basically rotating the space. Again, we typically are representing our, our words in a hundred dimensions or so, but if we wanna make the dimensions from 1900 correspond to the dimensions from 1905, we have to do something to unify that. We developed a way of doing that using localized linear regression to, to take the, the tr try to preserve the position of words as much as possible, okay? Then once we have tried to have unified all the dimensions or representations, we can look for words that have moved more from one year time period to the next than other words, okay? And by properly doing a statistical analysis of this, we can figure out which uh, words have moved by an amount to be interesting enough to say that it has probably changed its meaning. So again, the, the, the technically interesting part here is given two independent embeddings, how do we bring them into the same embedding space? And um, we did this by, like I said, you know, if you could think about it, we want, ideally, if the dimensions mean the same thing, cat in 1900 should be basically in the same position, position as cat in 1905. So we have a lot of constraints. Any word that appeared in both, in, in both corpora over the period kind of represents a training point. We want to find the rotation that um, preserves the position of these points as well as possible, okay? And once we do that, then again, it's the outlier points that become interesting. So when you start taking a look at this, when are the, we, we developed a statistical method to tell when is it that words change meanings in interesting ways. Um, and again, I, I think many people are obviously gay is a, is a classic example like I described, used to mean happy, now, 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 now it relates to sexuality. There were other words that changed in interesting ways. Um, tape at one point was a sticky thing then around 1970, tape became a magnetic recording thing. Let's tape this. Uh, some, oh, I understand David is taping this lecture, putting it on YouTube, okay? We were able to pick up that as being a meaningful change. Um, my favorite word shift was diet. Diet at one point meant what you ate, okay? And then diet meant what you didn't eat, okay? It changed from basically a diet of things, something like diet of bread and butter to let's go on a diet. And by analyzing word embeddings, we can kind of get this sense of how is it that things change over time. There are other interesting things you can start to do with these word embeddings. When you um, look at them again, points, are, word embeddings are points in space, every word is being represented as a point in space, is there more structure we can pull out of these embeddings than just whether or not they are um, two points are close to each other? There's kind of this notion of an is a relationship. We know that, um, uh, you know, basically banana is a fruit, okay? And grapefruit is a citrus, okay? Is there a way that we could kind of reconstruct orderings of um, what it would be kind of nice if we could not just have unstructured points, but construct basically hierarchies, orderings of these words based on their embeddings. And we were able to show that there, there is some structure in there when you uh, realize that, that even if you, all you have is word embeddings to build word embeddings, you had text, you knew how often the words occurred. And we developed a method where you can basically orient a word to a, point it to another word if it is nearby and it occurs less frequently, it's less important than the thing above it. 
And once you do that, you can start to com construct interesting hierarchies, interesting DAGs, if you wish, okay, on, um, on, word, uh, on word or graph embeddings, okay, to kind of help capture some of these kind of meanings. And some of these things are kind of evocative. When we did it on uh, WordNet words, we were able to reconstruct, uh, you know, things like that uh, geometry is a type of mathematics and calculus is a type of mathematics. Okay, so basically we did a bunch of experiments trying to predict um, in a, right now, a word embedding, something uh, using a famous embedding called GLOVE, trying to figure out if we could reconstruct hypernyms relations, these is a relations in words from a uh, famous dictionary called WordNet. And basically, um, you know, using our uh, heuristics and our, uh, that said that words typically wanna are, if it's an is a relationship, the, 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 the big, high, bigger category, probably the more general thing is probably the thing that a word that occurs more often. We were able to um, reconstruct, okay, a lot more of these relations than you would by chance. So basically these word embeddings can be used to capture the evolution of words and sign of their roles and uh, powers like that. Any questions so far? Concerning- so Steve, there's a question that came through on, on the chat from Jiping Yang. What if you use the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal instead of Google Books? Intuitively, words used in newspapers are closer to real life than words used in some books. Okay, so there's a question of you're you're right that your embeddings are uh, are related to how um what your training corpora is, okay, and you know you might say oh newspapers give better English than Wikipedia, um and that's probably true maybe perhaps okay but actually Wikipedia is is very good okay. So I don't think there is much shame in training on Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is generally written by people who know, know how to write. Um, I will also tell you that even when you train on, I will say rougher corpora, like web te text on the web, okay? Um, generally speaking, the embeddings are, are going to be meaningful. So in fact, it may be more important to have a larger amount of training data than it is to have it, it written by, um, you know, by, by you know, that, it, that there's a trade-off between quality and amount. And it may very well be that this is a game where amount, okay, trumps quality on some level. Okay, and if that answers your question or something. So, so generally speaking, it, it's when, when we build these embeddings, um, I'm not so worried about what the corpora is. You use the most that you can. One of the good things is that these embedding, word embedding methods are very fast to train. So we don't mind, you know, we, 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 we can work on a large amount of data, okay, to get them to mean what we want. So um, Steve, there's another question from Helen Hoffman. Glove is a static embedding, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Glove is a static embedding. Each word has one embedding. If we are using Bird or Elmo dynamic embedding, each word has max three embeddings. How do we calculate graph distance? Okay, so first of all, again, there, there is, if we think of the history of these methods, okay, word embeddings were a tremendous advance in natural language processing. More recently, there have been these uh, high, these contextual word embeddings that have been developed that uh, using the, that, that power these, these other uh, more powerful language models like BERT and things like that that are now really the state of the art in natural language processing. Um, I guess the short answer is that, that for the kinds of analyses that, that, that we are gonna be doing here, we are not gonna use contextual word embeddings. Um, contextual word embeddings have obviously a lot of power and a lot of advantages, but there are things you can do if a word only means one thing, okay? And if you, if you take it that uh, a word is a point in space, that's what we did with the, uh, in trying to predict the meaning of words as they changed. This was something that we can do. So the rest of the talk's gonna talk about um, 
static word embeddings, okay? Um, and for, for things like the shift detection, that's probably the right way to do it, okay? Uh, for a lot of NLP, things like the, the problems that I talked about earlier about uh, named entity recognition and things like that, the contextual word embeddings and the models like BERT are, pro are the state of the art now. Okay, any other questions before I move on? I see one more question that uh, came in from Marcin uh, Peperziki. Is there a way of using word embeddings to distinguish between groups, uh, for instance, tribes, regions, etc.? For example, can we compare Democrats versus Republican languages? Okay, so there are a lot of problems in NLP that are related to, for example, classifying texts, okay? Document classification. So a, a reasonable question might be, um, given uh, a, a article, was it written by a Democrat or a Republican? And you could imagine that suppose you wanted to solve a problem like that, you would need annotated examples of Democrats' texts and Republicans' texts. But what you would like to probably do is that the presumption would be that they probably use words in different ways, that, that they, they talk about different things. The word embeddings now present the, 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 the right kind of feature that you might use to build a model for doing this kind of separation. So a simple way, for example, which is probably too crude for that particular task, would be to try to take, use the word embeddings to try to come up with a uh, embedding for a larger text. Like let's say, let's say they were tweets. A tweet is a short text. You might imagine that if we take all the words in the tweet and add their word embeddings together, now we've got an embedding for the tweet. It add them up or average them up, okay? We've now got an embedding for the tweet. And now you might very well train a model given the embedding of the tweet as a feature. Can you tell Democrat from Republican? These models like BERT that we were talking about, these higher order language models, produce more sophisticated embeddings of, of, of sentences and longer texts. Okay, then just adding up the embeddings. But yes, this is what, what's great about the word embeddings is they give you features of what words mean. And from this, you can then build models to solve whatever task you're interested in. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on from words. Again, word embeddings naturally were developed for words and language. Um, but we found an interesting way to use them for trying to get features from graphs, okay? So a graphs meaning networks, okay? So a lot of life is um, a, a, a big application in uh, machine learning is that you would like to be able to given connection, given network information, try to connectivity information, try to predict properties of the vertices. So again, someone was asking me about Democrats and Republicans uh, a while ago. What you could imagine a problem. Suppose I had your fa the Facebook graph of every person that is here, okay? I know who, you, for each node, what friends you have. You might want to, from based on the connectivity information, could I predict whether you're a Democrat or a Republican? It's probably the case that if you are, have a lot of Democratic friends, you're probably a Democrat. And if you have a lot of Republican friends, you're probably a Republican. Okay. Certainly, if you're Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, you want to know for every node in the Facebook graph, every person, what ads should they show you? Will you like this kind of ad? Will you buy this kind of product? Okay. To build a model like that, they want you need to try to develop features for every person in the social network. One of these features that is very powerful are the connections. They, you also have things like likes and, and stuff like that. But the question is, is there a way we could take the connectivity information and reduce it to features, okay, that will be useful for building classifiers on nodes, 
Okay. And so we developed this method called deep walk that basically tried to do that. The um, input you could imagine would be the adjacency matrix or the adjacent, or since these things are usually sparse, the adjacency list representation of a graph. We would like to try to represent it by an N vertex by D matrix. D is gonna be the dimension of our representation. So each vertex has a D-dimensional representation such that similar vertices have similar, um, you know, have similar representations, okay? If you are a Democrat, someone who's very close to you in, in embedding space probably also is a Democrat, okay? And that's the kind of representation we would like to be able to build. And so how do we actually end up doing this? Well, we end up using a um, analogy with word embeddings. Remember, why did word embeddings work? Word embeddings took short phrases, perhaps sentences, and said if you could build a um, something that distinguished between the um, a real sentence and a sentence where you randomly corrupted one of the words, then you must know something about the words. To capture the, some, the same role as sentences, what if we take a graph and just take a random walk on it? Start from some vertex, go to a neighbor, go to a neighbor, go to a neighbor. Sentences are sequences of words. Random walks are sequences of vertices. Word embeddings took sentences and came up with what the meanings are. What if we generate a large number of random walks on an arbitrary graph, run this through the word embedding machinery. Now, um, the representation for each walk element, meaning a vertex, okay, will capture what the vertex means. And this proved to be a very, very, a, 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 is a very simple idea, but proved to be astonishingly popular, okay, and proved to work pretty well. These are some results that, uh, you know, on some task where we used the embeddings from deep walk against other ways of taking a network and reducing it. This is for some classification task. And uh, generally speaking, what was good about our method was the features proved to be very, very powerful for building good models. And it was also fast to get these kind of embeddings. Normally, there are other methods for trying to take a graph or a matrix and try to reduce it to a d-dimensional represent an n by d representation. Things like S, you know singular value decomposition or PCA and things like this. These methods tend do not scale very well for large graphs, but the random walk methods we have do scale very very well. And so this is something that has become astonishingly popular. Everybody is doing the deep walk, okay? Um, you know, um, basically it, it's a method that uh, kind of gives you a way to use the basic idea of embeddings now on networks instead of just on words, okay? And um, pr produces very, very good features. So here's an example of some project that we worked on where, um, which to me captures how good, okay, um, embeddings are, degrees graph embeddings. This is the result of deep walking Belgium. What is Belgium? Belgium is a country, that much I think you know. We had, a, I was working with uh, a student who uh, had access to the uh, call graph of, uh, from a major, be Belgium telephone company. So every vertex represents a person in Belgium and there were edges between two people who spoke to each other over the phone. Now, what do we know about Belgium? One thing that's interesting is that Belgium is divided among two major languages. There are French speakers and there are Flemish speakers. And they're smaller communities of German speakers and English speakers. What does this show? This shows what if you just take the call graph of Belgium, build the deep walk representation on it, project this down to two dimensions, 
and then color each vertex based on what language they spoke. The, you know, that, 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 you know, when, when you bought the phone in this Belgium, in this, from this Belgian telco, there was a setting where you could say, do you want your messages to be in French, Flemish, German, or English? So we knew what language they liked to speak. And what do you see? It's very, very obvious that the, the French speakers speak to the French speakers. The Dutch speakers speak to the, 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 the Dutch speakers. And you also see the, the English neighborhoods and the French and the German neighborhoods. It's not that these people only spoke one language because you know everyone in Belgium presumably speaks at least two or three different languages. But still, if you are someone who's, whose favorite language is Flemish, you probably spend more time uh, speaking to someone in Flemish, okay? And this is the kind of thing that is captured naturally without any training, okay? Just by building the deep walk embedding. It's kind of, what's great about it is this gives you an unsupervised way to get a representation of what the vertices mean. And again, there's, you know, there's a lot of things. I, I really like looking at these embeddings and seeing what they kind of me meant. So at one point, uh, we started working on a problem from analyzing Wikipedia. Could we figure out whether two people were, which people were historically similar to each other? So who's similar, should be similar to um, Abraham Lincoln? Well, probably other presidents and things from that time. Who should be similar to Albert Einstein? Probably famous physicists. Who should be similar to Mozart? You know, classical composers, okay? So the question is, could we, how could we read Wikipedia articles and try to tell whether or not people are, what people are similar to each other? So we built a reasonable evaluation metric. I don't want to go through this. That basically was given a task of, given three people, two, two of whom were relatively close to each other by some annotation and the other is picked at random, can you tell them apart, okay? And we had different standards of how hard this was to try to identify who the outlier was among the three. And we started doing this by doing natural language processing. We figured we, if we read and studied the Wikipedia article, we would be able to tell how similar or far apart the two people are. But actually we found that we did much better by throwing out all the text from Wikipedia and just building this deep walk embedding. Wikipedia pages linked to other pages. That defines a graph. By doing a deep walk on this, we can figure out what each vertex means. And by just using the, 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 the graph embedding and throwing out the text, we did better than we did by trying to be very smart and reading the Wikipedia text. If you believe this, there's more information in Wikipedia in the links than there is actually in the text. Or probably more to the point, there's more accessible information in the links than the text using our kind of embedding method. And again, looking, I find it very evocative when you look at who are the nearest neighbors of people in Wikipedia deep walk space. The nearest neighbors of, of Beethoven are classical composers. The nearest neighbors of Mick Jagger are Beatles and Rolling Stones. The nearest neighbors of Einstein are you know, physicists. Nearest neighbors of Scarlett Johansson are actors and actresses. The nearest neighbors to Stephen Skeena in Wikipedia are Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And amazingly, okay, two out of three of us are billionaires. Okay. So anyway, but, but it, you should see it, but we are certainly all computer scientists. And it kind of does show that kind of these representations capture some notion of similarity or connectedness that is very, very important. Um, you know, I, I, being able to tell when things are similar, I think is a very, you know, is very, very useful for browsing, for, for understanding things, okay? And we, 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 we did some studies of these kind of things. And since then we've built, gone and developed um, other methods for building um, 
these embeddings from graphs. Um, one of our approaches that's that, that works somewhat well, pretty well is something called HARP, which is where we try to look for global structures. Okay, global, we embed parts of the graph and then use that to help uh, recursively embed, in, embed smaller structures. Basically trying to build graph embeddings using ideas from problem, the way people build good systems for drawing networks, okay? And there have been lots and lots of other embedding methods that have been developed since our the original DeepWalk paper. All of them work seemingly a tiny bit better than DeepWalk, okay, at least in the papers that we write and other people write. But in general, the DeepWalk method has proven surprisingly resilient. Um, in fact, there was this survey that I liked of some, uh, where these people were surveying um, what you call it. Sorry, let's go back there. We're, we're surveying um, what you call it, uh, different graph embedding methods. There have been a zillion graph embedding methods developed. And their conclusion was basically, even though DeepWalk was really the first one, it still basically is about as good or better than many of the successors, okay, which I feel is kind of an amazing thing for such a simple method, okay, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, such, so, on such a relatively important task. Um, the, the, the other aspect of um, these kind of graph embeddings is that the world has, uh, you know, that this kind of led to, um, yeah, kind of in some sense, this is the forerunner of, uh, graph convolutional networks. There's other ways of taking graphs and reducing them to features that have become popular in machine learning. There's this whole area now of graph representation learning, such as this, which you know, I encourage you to read this book by Hamilton if this is what you're interested in. And um, these GCNs differ from um, what you call it, graph embeddings in certain ways in both Face the goal is in some sense to capture a representation of what a vertex means. These Jeff neural networks have a couple of advantages or differences. Um, one of them is that uh, if you have labels on uh, the vertices, if you know, for example, that some people are Democrats and some people are Republicans, maybe you could exploit that to build a better graph embedding. And these GCNs try to predict um, things, including the labels and any other data that you have. So you can kind of train a, a specific thing to represent, you know, to, to be an application specific embedding. That's one of the advantages of these uh, graph convolutional networks. The other advantage is that um, they are kind of methods that for any neighborhood of vertices would give you an embedding. So they make it easier. You, you can, in principle, compute what the representation for a vertex should be, even if you didn't have it at the time you were training the network, okay? You can impute embeddings for new vertices in a good way, okay? And this is sometimes a very powerful thing. So these are also good things. But just like word embeddings, I think, have in certain contexts are you know, static word embeddings have good power, are, are useful for a lot of things. These static embeddings are, are, are useful for a lot of things, okay? Because sometimes it's very nice to have a single representation of what the vertex means, okay? Any, question, any questions here about graph embeddings? I've rattled on for a while, so. So we, we have a couple of questions, but maybe I'll wait till the end and then read those to you. Okay, you want me to keep going? Yes, well, there, okay, there's a question. Maybe I'll, I'll um, share one question from Huang. May, may I ask what the biggest challenge for DeepWalk is right now? So the biggest thing, problem that let's say, so DeepWalk I think is good. One problem, which is what I'm gonna address in my next section is that um, DeepWalk is still, you know, on a very large network, deep walk is time consuming. So you'd like to be able to, if let's say, like one of my dreams has always been, I wanted to um, 
come up with an embedding of the entire World Wide Web. You could imagine that the World Wide Web is the biggest graph someone like me can get my hands on. Mark Zuckerberg can get a, his hands on bigger graphs. But if I wanted to try to build an embedding of a very, very large network, large meaning not millions of vertices, but hundreds of millions of vertices or billions of vertices, these tend to be slow. So performance is one limitation of deep walk, okay? And, you know, another thing is that there probably are, it per probably performs somewhat different on um, sparse versus dense graphs and things like, but actually it's pretty resilient to that. The main thing that I would say is, um, you know, a limitation tends to be speed. Okay, so any have, other questions? We have a question from Yanis Kutis. Is there a graph theoretic or mathematical understanding on why these embedding methods do find interesting clusters in these data? Okay, so there is a question of, if you say, what is it that, um, that uh, these, these um, word embeddings or graph embeddings are doing? Uh, th there's a theoretical understanding that in some sense, uh, what they are doing is factoring, you know, you, you could imagine building a, let's first think about the word embeddings, okay? You can kind of think of it as being, um, think about a matrix where there's something called a pointwise mutual information, how similar the contexts are around the vertices, okay? There are results that say, word embeddings basically are like doing matrix factorizations of these pointwise mutual information matrices. And there's a similar interpretation to what uh, you can say that the graph is doing, basically. Now what we're looking at is, um, you know, at each vertex, there's a question of what is the uh, kind of vertices, what is reachable in its immediate neighborhood, okay? And if you build matrices capturing that, factoring that is what deep walk is doing. So there is some theoretical understanding, exactly what you do. And, and, and one thing that I guess is interesting to it is um, there's also a question of what is the dependence the embedding has on edges, which are basically like hops of length one versus longer walks, hops of length, two, uh, you know, two hops or three hops or something like that. In principle, the, um, you know, the, the embeddings that you're getting are some faction of, inf some, some information from one hops, two hops, three hops, and so on. And um, there are embedding methods that study whether, you know, whether, you know, wh whether you want to weigh, um, uh, you know, uh, walks of a particular length, you know, vertices that are separated by walks of a particular length more than others. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of what uh, I'm thinking here. Thanks. So we have a lot of questions. I'll ask one more and then I'll save then the other I'll questions to, to the end. Um, but just okay. one, one last question at this point, and this is from Pietro. Um, given two graphs, for instance, a graph and a randomized version of the same graph, are there any theoretic results for guaranteeing that similar nodes in graph space are mapped into similar embeddings in the latent space? Okay, so what I think what you might be, again, is a different things what you might be saying. So if we were to be given um, to uh, a, a graph and perhaps a permuted version of the graph, so it's isomorphic to each other, but the vertices have different IDs, we deep walk one, we deep walk the other, we would expect that the uh, embeddings are gonna be different. The dimensions don't have a correspondent, direct correspondence between them. But we would expect that the distances between vertices should basically generally be preserved. That's kind of what we would expect. It's not that there's gonna be one embedding for the, this graph that's certainly gonna respect isomorphism. That would be too hard. Isomorphism is, you know, an intractable problem or, you know, a not known a fast way to, to deal with it. But on the other hand, we would expect that the relative distances should grossly roughly be preserved over the two uh, 
different embeddings. Any questions? Okay, let me move on now, since that's what Dave, David's incurred. Let me go to a, a last topic on graph embeddings. And maybe that's pretty much where, maybe that's where I'll end up stopping. So when we talk about deep walk, again, I like the fact deep walk, I like it. it. The embeddings are nice. We use them for a bunch of things and I'm usually happy with them. Um, but uh, one thing that's a problem is that they are very, you know, although it's still faster than a lot of its competitors, it's still slow on um, large graphs. So one of the tests we use is a 1 million node graph called YouTube graph. In order to embed it, it takes 30 CPU days to build an embedding of that. Now, because it's multi-threaded, 30, 30 CPU days is not 30 days, but, we would, but it would be great if there were faster methods to embed graphs, much faster methods. Um, and again, it's, this is faster than um, spectral methods and things like that. So, but still it's, you know, the time is time. So one other approach to building fast embeddings is something very interesting based on random projection. What is the idea of random projection? Let's say that we've got over here, the black things, the black uh, vectors you see here are um, represent rows of an adjacency matrix. And you can imagine that the first vertex, okay, has a very similar um, row to the second matrix. So the first vertex is adjacent to almost the same things that the second vertex is. The third vertex is quite different. Now, suppose we take those rows of the adjacency matrix and compute the dot product with a, of all of them with a random vector, okay? So we have a vector here of random numbers. If we do the dot products with the same random vector, a dot product of an adjacency row and a random vector is gonna be an, a number, okay? And what we would expect is that similar rows should have similar numbers. If you have wildly different rows like one and three, the dot product is probably gonna be quite different. So what is the idea of random projection methods? If I wanna construct a hundred dimensional embedding, what if I take every vertex, the adjacency of every vertex and dot it with a hundred different random vectors? Now I'm gonna have a hundred dot products associated with each vertex. Okay, that's a hundred dimensional embedding. Similar adjacencies should have roughly similar dot products, vectors of dot products. And so if we measure the distance between these things, okay, we will end up with uh, you know, a reasonable representation of this, okay? And again, dot products should be fast, okay? Um, the, you know, that said, previous red, random projection methods that we worked on, that we saw in graphs, tended to produce somewhat low, you know, the, the, the quality wasn't as good as we would like. So we developed a method for using random projections that um, took advantage of the fact that, um, just like with deep walk, the fact that we were uh, composed by, um, what you call it, by, uh, the, the fact that um, that deep walk was figuring out a contribution of vertices that were one hop away, two hops away, three hops away, we can get the effect of multiple hops by raising the adjacency matrix to a power. If you take the adjacency matrix of a, of a graph and you square it, entry ij is going to be the number of paths from i to j of length two. And so it would be nice to be able to take our adjacency matrix and project not only the original, but powers of it. You'd like to raise it to the second power, third power, fourth power, okay? And then weigh the contributions of these independently. If you do this, you can take advantage of associativity of multiplication. So instead of multiplying an n by n matrix by an n by n matrix where n is big, 
you could make it an n by d multiplication where d an n by d matrix okay if you were if you uh you know use associativity there okay and this gives you a way to compute representations of first second third maybe third powers okay and weigh them okay in interpreting the importance of the vertices there's also normalization techniques you'd like them the trouble is if you're counting the number of pairs okay these things can can quickly come to dominate there's a transformation that we 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 did that basically normalizes these things so that the numbers don't get uh that, that the counts are are not basically a, a fast way to do things to make the count something like sublinear okay and this proves to be a helpful thing but when we're done what we have here is a projection the thing in the center is our um what you call it our deep walk image this is something where we projected part of the web a bunch of websites and we had the last thing they were dot dot jp dot uk they were from different countries and when we took at the content between them you would expect that the um the different related countries websites within a country are more likely to link to each other than websites across from that <clears throat> when you look at deep walk you can see that the clusters we get very strongly reflect the country of origin of the websites when you look at our competitor random projection method you get a pretty picture but you don't see good clusters on things when we used our method which we called fast rp we get nice clusters and so the advantage here is that these random projections are wildly wildly faster thousands of times faster than deep walk they're not quite as good quality but they are thousands of times faster and that sometimes is a very good trade off to be making any questions about that at this point i think i'd rather take questions than uh than than go through my last topic which is last because i think it's a little bit of a digression so um maybe this is where i'll end what i'm saying and uh take any questions you guys may have thank you so much steve um and there are quite a number of questions so i'm going to just switch the screen to this mode and um, go through some of the questions that were asked. One is from Ji Peng Yan, who asks, um, he's studying interactions between CEOs and investors by examining textual data of investor questions and CEO answers. We try to capture whether a CEO answers questions directly. I'm using cosine similarity between question vector and answer vector, Jacquard similarity, and word to vec models. Do you have any other suggestions? So again, there, the idea here is that, uh, again, we talked a little bit about, we talked about, I was talking about word, word embeddings and I said, described a primitive way to take a uh, short document and build a rep vector representation of that by adding the vectors together. A standard way of doing this, there are more powerful methods is things like BERT that build you know, um, more interesting representations of what a sentence might mean or a question might be. And again, finding the um, cosine similarity, this, the, the, essentially the distance between two of these vectors is a perfectly rational thing to do. So that's a, you know, that's a common kind of thing, how well it works in your particular case. And if there are better ways from that, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it at the moment, but you know, that's a standard kind of thing to do if you want to measure the similarity between a question and an answer or a similarity between two questions or two answers, this is the kind of technology that one might use. Thank you. The, the next question is from Dan Tong Yu, who asks, for graph neural networks, do you have insight on designing low-pass filters or high-pass filters on graphs? Um, I don't have any particular insights on these kind of things. So. Um, so no, this is something I, I'm not the right man for this. The next question comes from Michael Lan. For graph convolution networks, I heard unlike convolutional networks, which build up from edges to more complex features and later hidden layers, GCNs don't build up from nodes to subgraphs. Is there any paper discussing this? 
So there are a lot of, again, there, are, you know, the whole area of, of graph, um, what you call it, of, of these graph convolution networks is now a huge area. Again, I would probably recommend that you read the book by Hamilton, okay, that I flashed up here on graph representation learning. There are different levels on what you're interested in doing with graphs. So um, one is, again, the, all the stuff that I've been talking about has been worrying about what is the meaning of a vertex. But in many cases, you're interested in other things. You're interested in, for example, are two graphs similar, similar to each other? Maybe graphs represent molecules and you'd like to know are two molecules similar to each other? This is a different, you know, a related but different kind of problem. And, you know, so, so I would re recommend, again, if you're interested in these kind of things, the book by Hamilton is probably a good overview of what the state of the art is. And um, maybe one final question from Dan Tong Yu. What's the connection between your random projection and Krylov subspaces? Okay, Krylov subspaces, um, uh, I will confess, in my ignorance, I don't know what a Krylov subspace is, okay? So I'm going to plead guilty there. I will say that it is, it is these random projection methods, and this may be kind of the same, related to the same thing. In theoretical computer science, there's a, there's a you know, the, the, there, there's a famous theorem called the johnson linden strauss theorem, or, okay, which, is, which argues that if you take a matrix, okay, you take a point in a certain number of dimensions and you, you basically do a random projection to a small, relatively small number of dimensions, it still preserves the relative distances with a certain kind of guarantee, okay? And this is one of the things that kind of, if you say, why is it that the random projection method should work? That is the theoretical reason, pedigree as to why these methods work, okay? Is that kind of, um, we're, we're doing a similar kind of random projection and these would be expected if you use enough dimensions as a function of the number of things that you are embedding, okay? It will preserve, uh, you know, it will, it will basically preserve relative distances, okay? So that's, I guess, my, my answer to that one. So Steve, thank you again for giving this fantastic talk. There's been a lot of questions and comments in the chat, but this was a great talk to kick off our spring 2021 semester where we have data science lectures every Wednesday at 4 p.m. So again, on behalf of NJIT, thank you very much for this great talk. Hey, thanks, it's been nice, nice to talk.